2021 has gotten off to a good start. I think, I think we are in a place where we see vaccines beginning to work. We see the world starting to get back to a sense of formality. And at the rake, we like to touch base with people around the world and uh, catch up and feel a sense of uh, community and brotherhood from thousands of miles away. And for me, somebody who I've always admired and liked and think shows great um, integrity and love of the subject matter that the rake holds so dear, especially with bespoke in cigars and shoes, is Kirby Allison. And here I am with him right now. Kirby, hello, how are you? Yeah, Tom, thank you so much. It's so great to see you. And again, it's a, you know an absence of travel, I think, that most of us have really been you know, wanting a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of connection with, you know, that brotherhood you speak of, of the well-dressed. And so, of course, the rake is, is um, you know, is a, is a um, you know, is one of the spotlights there kind of really illuminating the craft. And uh, we do a small part kind of following in the footsteps of, uh, of the greats like you guys. But uh, it's always a pleasure to chat. And I think today, you know, if we're lucky, even smoke a cigar, uh, trying to bridge the gap as best we can in the absence of being in London. Well, we haven't got Nick Clark here to um, sort of do us for plagiarism, but so we could just say that this is solving the coronavirus one corona at a time. One corona at a time. He's really coined that, uh, you know, better than anyone else. And his show, I mean, he and Max, I think, you know, I've I've been delighted to see, you know, their folks and sons, you know, kind of a you know series take off. And I just uh, was writing him today, hoping that uh, once things return to normal, that that's one of the uh, uh, the things we keep and carry forward. Yeah, I'd be amazed if he doesn't. And I, th I think he, you know Nick's um, never short of a thing to say and, uh, and and giving us something to learn from. And so I I, I I echo that and share the sentiments that you do as well. And um, and delightful to see that you know the next Fouch generation is sort of taking over. Well, not taking over. I won't get Nick still. Holds the torch, yeah. but Max is following in, in, in his footsteps, and that's really wonderful. Yeah. Um, is it, which is great, uh, Kirby, is that the, um, the, the, despite the fact that we've all been kind of hermetically sealed, uh, that, that community that we speak of, you know, did actually sort of make itself manifest and make itself known to us um, through wonderful things like Zoom and the internet. And um, so why don't we try and refer to this, or at least with our fingers firmly crossed, that this is the kind of bookending of, of the kind of coronavirus sort of uh, cross-continental chats, because yeah. you were saying that you think you're trying to book yourself a flight to London, and so hopefully next time we talk, it'll be face-to-face. -face. Yeah, um, well, but in the meantime, this is the last time we go so long without being able to, uh, to travel uh, transcontinental. I mean... Completely. You know, when's the last time? 100%. Probably not since World War II, you know, has uh, transcontinental travel been uh, stifled as much as it has been the last year. Oh, yeah, no, I completely, yeah, 100% it must be that. But, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, let's let's just see. Let's just keep our fingers crossed and, and uh, stay safe. Yeah. So what have you got in your hand? Well, That's a so I'm thing. a... I figured in such good company, I was going to break out the uh, the top shelf. So this is a Cohiba uh, Robusto. Um and, uh, you know, the Robusto is one of my favorite formats for a mid-afternoon smoke, you know. Uh, generally, I prefer the lar longer formats, um, you know, like a long stale or something like that. Or a, um, But uh, this is an amazing smoke, just a simple Corona uh, kind of Robusto. And uh, so that's what I have today. What about yourself? Uh, so this is the Kidose Senadores. It's the limited edition from 2019. Uh, the uh, the format is actually pretty much sort of my my favorite format. It's a slim ring gauge. Uh, it's uh, a good kind of 45 minute to an hour smoke, depending on what speed you smoke at. And ultimately, um, it uh, it has a kind of it has a nice feel in the jaw, has a nice feel in the hands. It's not too thick. I've had a couple of thick ones recently. The 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 new I don't know if you had the Davidoff Year of the Ox, which is a fabulous smoke. That's, yeah. Smokes terrifically well, but it's quite a big, hefty cigar. Yeah, what is this? This is quite long. This ring gauge? No, no, no. This the one? Year of the Ox is like a 54 or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would have given it a bit bit thicker than that, but hold on. I've got, I'll go on here. I mean, at least, yeah, at least 54, maybe 56. So look at, yeah. This is probably more like your sort of mid 40s. And yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, terrific cigar. And. I mean, why, 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 
waste time. Let's perhaps light these up and yeah. get chatting. And but yeah. you, why don't you kick us off? Because since we last spoke, there's been great changes at your end. Um, so update me on, on all things Kirby Addison. Yeah, so we have uh, certainly not lost any time in uh, 2020. And I think one of the biggest biggest kind of changes we underwent in 2020 was, you know, really doing something that we'd been, uh, you know, meaning and planning to do for a long time, which was, um, you know, rebrand from hangarproject.com to kirbyallison.com. It was a long time in the making, um, but we simply just grew out of the name Hanger Project. I mean, you know, back in 2007, whenever I started the business, we were just selling hangers uh, and we've come such a far way. Uh, to still kind of call ourselves the Hanger Project, it really felt constraining. Uh, so in 2020, we relaunched the website into KirbyAllison.com and underwent, you know, really a complete rebranding effort, which uh, was monumental in its, in, in its effort. But um, I think something I'm very pleased with now. Fantastic. Um, and the uh, the kind of the, the the grand project, the plan. There must be plans afoot to to keep that growth going, or you. Uh, sort of happy with where things are sitting at the moment? Well, I mean, you know, the plan is, um, you know, the idea was to give us a platform that would really allow us to grow over the next 10 to 20 years. You know, again, I felt that we hit the limit on Hanger Project, uh, you know, as we were tie, you know, as we were adding, you know, sovereign grade ties and pocket squares and, um, you know, kind of all of our other clothing accessories. It just didn't feel right. Uh, so, you know, I don't know specifically where it will lead us, but, you know, it has given us a platform that will allow us to grow much more broadly uh, than we are right now. And, you know, that's kind of what makes me excited about the future is, you know, as I continue to travel, as I continue to, um, you know, meet really incredible makers, uh, is to be able to bring more of that kind of under the Kirby Allison umbrella. Yeah, and if I may, I think that whilst there is the, the important sort of, um, sort of uh, commerce aspect to what you do, um, for me, I really love the, the efforts and the time you put in to go around the world and see terrific makers uh, and, and craftsmen and, and help tell their story, uh, which, you know, to, 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 um, uh, you know, to, to no one to distract so much from what it is that you've done, you know, was the ori original uh, mission of the rake, was the yeah. idea of telling these stories and you've done it in a in a medium that we sort of haven't been doing it, it in and, and you know we would like to but I think that the, the the initiative you took to kind of go to uh people that you love and want to tell the story of is has has been great fun I've also loved all your unboxing videos apparently they are insanely popular ones when it comes to sort of trainers and you know millions of people will tune in to watch people unboxing stuff all around the world I don't know yeah. what the but then you come along and then you'll do a bespoke pair of shoes yeah why and, not? <laughs> and and it was the first time i kind of seen that and i thought well i i'm riveted i want to know and uh so so you know th that side of things i hope is, is something that will continue when you're able to travel it yeah well i think the you know for me whenever i was you know kind of you know growing up i mean you know, I was always interested in quality craftsmanship and tradition, but it was so much less accessible than it is now. And I still remember my first time to London, you know, walking down Savile Row. I mean, other than a few photographs, I'd never seen the inside of, of one of those uh, bespoke shops. And I was still intimidated to walk, walk in. And so one of the things I hope we're able to do is to really bring that world of quality craftsmanship and tradition and, and bespoke uh, into people's you know lives in a way that's much more approachable, and hopefully uh, that has an impact on the actual makers, uh, and um, you know hopefully you know introducing more people uh, to the craft. I mean, it's certain to. I mean, you know anything that the. the I mean, one of their greatest sins, I think, to, for, for um, if, if I was to criticize anything with these guys, is that they're their kind of lack of initiative and grasp of, of, of the kind of the internet and communications, I think it has been, has been problematic. But yeah. I think that um, when there are people like you coming along, making it happen, they'll see the benefits of it and then hopefully take the initiative themselves yeah. as well. Going. Well, hopefully they see value in it. I mean, I know that uh, our viewers certainly have really enjoyed the pieces we've done. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, hopefully it's helpful, you know, to their efforts. I mean, uh, we certainly enjoy, you know, learning about what they do. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's easier to have someone help you 
talk about yourself or um, you know talk about you for you than it is to talk about oneself. And for the British, you know, that are so reserved, especially you know in and around Savile Row, I mean, that was you know one of the fulcrums was you know just you know discretion. You know, the idea of you know kind of broadcasting yourself on television probably just doesn't come naturally to these guys. Um, I was watching something recently with Thomas Mahone. Uh, at uh, what is it, Ready Man? Now he's uh, you know he's left English Cut and he's got kind of a new thing going, you know. But he was a cutter back at Anderson and Shepherd a long time ago, and he was describing how back then, I mean, you were still you still required an introduction, uh, and whenever you walked in the store, you know, uh, the shopkeeper would ask, you know, one, you know, who's introducing you, and two, which club do you belong? Yeah, I mean that was yeah, I mean. There was, I mean, it isn't that long ago. There was that sort of sense of it being, I mean, initiating yourself into a uh, into a tailor's rather than walking in as a potential customer for them. It's like yeah. an entire inversion of your your kind of current cultural commercial relationship with a client. Like it just it doesn't bear any resemblance to how businesses run today. No, but it's yeah. it, but it is entirely true. Um, and fascinating. And for a second there, when you were talking about um, uh, broadcasting yourself and talking about oneself, it's not what the Brits do. I was worried when you said you were watching something recently, you were going to go into a recent interview by uh, one Oprah Winfrey and broadcasting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a funny you mentioned that. I mean, I didn't watch the interview. And my wife, on principle, even though she read everything about it in the press, wouldn't watch it. It was so upsetting to her. <laughs> I mean, never has there been a greater divide since, shoot, I mean, I don't know, the early 20th century uh, in the royal family. It's really, it's really unfortunate. I've, I've, from, from what I've heard, though, the Queen has gotten so many, so many letters and messages of support that, um, you know, she's, it's, it's, it's sort of genuinely moved her. It's like bucket loads, like, like yeah. trucks of, of people sending her letters. And they, she replies yeah. to all of them, but they are, they're all replied to. Um, but well, yes, it is. It's uh, it's quite the topic of conversation at the moment. Yeah. Well, um, her eternal grace. I mean, I felt that uh, her response couldn't have been any more, uh, you know, regal. Uh, well, there's the, okay, so editors and journalists all over the world were like, ah, that's that's yeah. how you do. We, you know, we all look for the perfect sentence. We always, especially especially when we when we finish any article, we look for the sort of as short as possible, but as striking as possible. And then she wrote that, and we were like, ah, that was done. It was brilliant. Well, anyway, hopefully that, I mean, I don't know where that's going, but I feel like that train hasn't uh, fully left the rails yet. <laughs> Not quite. So let's see. <laughs> <laughs> on our next, on our next. <laughs> yeah. So have um, you been able you. to enjoy many cigars kind of uh, during lockdown? I mean, all the typical places are closed. Well, um, I have the benefit of an extremely patient and generous wife. And as you can see, I'm currently in my dining room uh, slash sort of makeshift office while the, <coughs> while, uh, the you know, lockdown has had us at home. Uh, and uh, this is the room which I am on occasion allowed to smoke. And uh, so, uh, but I also have a garden and I... Uh, you know, we have, you know, and one of the great, you know, we were quite a pragmatic country and very sensible in, in, in many ways. And one of the most sensible things we did was keep Davidoff of London open because Davidoff of London is to some, it, well, it's, it's classified as an essential service. And frankly, I think if there's anything that the government got right during COVID, it was keeping Davidoff of London open and referring to it as an yeah. essential service. If they only did that, one thing, that was it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they've done the vaccine pretty well, but, you know, yeah. that, that, that's minor compared to being able to access cigars, I think. And um, well. so, so yeah, no, you know, it, it, it hasn't been too bad. And, um, you know, it has been a shame, though, with um, not being able to see sort of like Terry, who made this jacket and, and has, has made loads of clothes for me over the years. And, you know, to see that he, you know, he's been able to kind of make it work at home. And, you know, he's been making for lots of clients, you know, during that time. But it just isn't what he wants to be doing and it's been really stunting as a, a you know for, for him so you know let, let's let's hope that it kind of 
a shift happens soon so they can kind of it can kind of get back up and running yeah well uh goodness i mean my heart really goes out to all the tailors and shoemakers that you know really rely on being able to travel and people being able to travel to visit them and um you know I, uh, april 12th couldn't come sooner enough i agree with that yeah very much so so yeah no i'll, I'll be sort of heading in to sort of say hello and send my sort of solidarity and love um along the way but um but you know what's interesting is that actually though, though it's been it's things have been closed you know as, as a magazine you know we've been able to kind of you know spread the good news spread the gospel um uh of of you know bespoke and of, of the luxury business and um and it's sort of the lifestyle that we kind of hope that you know people are like after when they read the magazine and i think that that that's actually sort of still been possible we've still been able to kind of reach out to people and and, and help them kind of communicate things and uh it's it's it'll be interesting to see how that changes when we get back into um into sort of normality but for example, we, we now, because we because we have this, like you, an ability to sell um, things through our website, the the magazine can be bought as a kind of sort of digital newsstand. You can order the magazine to your home from our website. And we, we, saw, we saw the sales of magazines go through the roof during this time. I mean, That's through great. the roof. I mean, I, we, we, we were genuinely shocked because we sell enormous amounts of things like Ruben Atchie, for example, and we have these lists of brands that we sell and, you know, the, the, the top 20 and all these sorts of things. And suddenly the Rake magazine was up in there. And we were, we were like, really? And people were, people were wanting to buy it and spend the money that was involved with actual shipping it. And, you know, they, they wanted to have something to read. Yeah. And I think that that's, I mean, it's extremely encouraging because, you know, magazines are meant to be having a terrible time at the moment. Yeah. The, the rake, I you know, with, without wanting to kind of blow our own home, we, we are we ha we we ended twenty twenty very strongly, and we, we we had a we had a great positive finish to the year. Yeah, good. And so I think that you know we go into this year with with that kind of positivity, and hoping to kind of continue it. Um, yeah, let's so that's, a, that's a really interesting leading indicator. I mean, I think in you know you, it's diff you know once something is taken away from you, you're able to appreciate it so much more. And I think, you know, people not being able to travel, to not be able to kind of get their cultural fix in London or Paris, uh, to not be able to, you know, have really anything made, you know, from any of their kind of uh, British-based tailors or shoemakers, it really kind of brought that into the spotlight of just really how much of a pleasure that process actually is. And so to see yeah. uh, sales of the rake go up, you know, really kind of speaks to, you know, hopefully the pent-up demand and interest, um, you know, in in this lifestyle, in dressing well, uh, and in the finer things that you guys cover so well. Yeah, and, and you know, I, mean, I think that one of the things, that, the way uh, in his great wisdom and eminence said, and I do, I do, I, 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 I believe him in this, is that he said that when all this is over and we all go out, we have our first night out at Mark's Club or wherever it is that people are in the world that they want to go, you know, the polo bar in New York or wherever. We're not going to go in our tracksuits. We've had enough of our tracksuits. Yeah. We're finished with our tracksuits. We don't need our pajamas anymore. We've had enough. We're going to want to dress it up. And then that was really, I mean, we, we just we just launched our, um, our, our Rake Taylor Garments uh, spring summer collection. And the, the whole idea and the narrative and the storytelling behind it ultimately is that it is a collection of clothing that is done uh, for um, for those people who want to kind of have a reinvigorated wardrobe as mm -hmm. doors to our houses are open and the flights are starting again and we have, we're able to go to the places that we want to go to. And that, uh, and also, you know, with, with the kind of value proposition in mind. So it's actually, it's, it's actually extremely affordable. I think we, we found ways of kind of making, tailoring something that doesn't need to necessarily break the bank. I think the bespoke customer will always be there. I think that people are very loyal to bespoke. And I think that, it, however, if you're going to do ready to wear, you need to bring both value and quality to the table and yeah. through fabrics and design and colors and all these sorts of things. That, that's how we do it. Yeah. And the I just, whole idea behind this collection is that we say, well, this is through our, through, through our kind of experience, this is the collection that we feel 
is what people are going to be after and will kind of suit this 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 next step into uh, the, this sort of bridge to normal living. Yeah. Um, well, and it's nice so, to see this done, you know, from a non fast fashion perspective, right? Because, you know, you get suit supply out there, you know, producing suits for under a thousand dollars, but it's not inspired by, you know, kind of classic tailoring and, uh, you know, really conservative kind of uh, principles. And so to see you, you know, collaborating with, you know, with uh, Chifanelli and Laura Piana, and of course, you know, the Rake's involvement kind of ensures that it, you know, is at least uh, respecting certain rules and fundamentals out there that'll make it look better. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's the other thing that we've done, it's, as you say, is that the, the, the Cifanelli, um collaboration, which is a, it's, it's an amazing thing because Lorenzo is a, is a real artist. I think he's, 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 a, he's an extraordinary designer. And when we sort of spoke to him and said, look, we were going to do a collection with, um, with you as a sort of capsule collection with the rake, for, for for the summer you know what do we do he he kind of he, he 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 threw himself into it created this extraordinary looking collection of everything from jackets trousers shirts ties everything all under a thousand euros actually to be honest, all under all under 900 euros but all made by laura piano Amazing. because we've we we've we've we've, we've sort of used our sort of ability to you know we, we we basically um, uh, exhausted people's generosity. So, you know, Laura <laughs> Piano is, and um, they've been extremely generous with with the sort of the fabric that they've um, they collaborated with. But it was it was with this sort of joint understanding that this is kind of a necessary thing to to do at the moment. And the collection looks amazing, um, and it's sort of it's all going to be up on the uh, yeah. soon after we have this chat. Um, and you know, very exciting. So it's it, it, luckily, you know, the good thing about um, working at the rake at the moment is that it's it's there are loads of plates spinning. So everyone's very stressed out, but that's a good thing because we're doing a lot. And I think that when 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 you know, it's not just a magazine anymore. And I think that uh, when when I started, which is now sort of coming up to seven years ago, it was just a magazine. That was kind of it. And the website was more like a blog. And uh, to see how it's sort of developed over that time has been quite an experience. So, yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Um, um, well, you guys certainly haven't wasted the year. I mean, you've made great use of COVID uh, to kind of double down on all things important. And uh, the content coming out of the magazine has been exceptional. You know, these chats that you've been doing uh, and posting to the YouTube channel have been uh, very refreshing. And then it's really been incredible to just see the explosive growth of the actual website you know, again, kind of aggregating all these uh, independent artisans that uh, are really kind of a little bit difficult to find and transact with and kind of putting that in a really edited way uh, on the Rake's website for people to, you know, to purchase. I think there's, you know, the, 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 yes, you're right. And there's lo I, think, I think there's loads more that can be done. Um, but I think that we, uh, uh, we, we, we've taken that, as you say, initial mission of basically going to Naples and searching the streets to find the best shirt maker in Naples. And firstly, initially telling their story, but now we're now sort of making things with them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all very exciting. And so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky to be part of it. And there's a very, very talented team who are kind of taking care of that, uh, who are based in the UK, based in Italy. And um, uh, yeah, so, you know, the, I mean, the exciting thing is actually though, Kirby, is that, um, and it's, it's something that you and I talk a lot about, is how the the expectation I think by lots of people is that the resource, the resource, the pool that we can draw from is a sort of ever diminishing pool. People are getting, people are being aged out of the, the industry, and people aren't coming in uh, in a young, at a young age and filling the gap where where when all people are retiring um, from the crafts. But actually, you know, as you guys, we we we've been seeing amazing young artisans come in and and take the reins and, and produce extraordinary yeah. work you're a judge of the uh the i mean you might sorry the, i might get the name of it the official name wrong but, but the, the the shoemaker of the year yeah. award. well the world championship of shoemaking and that was um well, that was a, a really i mean i mean talk about a talk about just an unprecedented event you know i mean one of those hadn't been held for a hundred years and here we were, you know, able to field a, a championship in shoemaking. I mean, talk about an archaic, uh, you know, craft. 
and you know get over 55 entries um, and a lot of them were exceptional and I'd say that a majority of the people you know entering were quite young and so you know as we look to the future of the industry I mean you guys had a great article about this uh, with kind of the females of Savile Row and of bespoke tailoring uh, you know there's so much young energy uh, kind of uh, blossoming uh, in uh, the industry right now that it's it's really it's exceptional it's exciting and I think it's really encouraging uh, for what the future holds uh, I really predict especially after the COVID uh, and um, you know how everything was constrained that you know that I I hope that you know we're kind of on the cusp of a renaissance of classic menswear of quality craftsmanship tradition bespoke tailoring shoemaking you know, of course, with the heritage makers uh, who will always be kind of the standard bearers, uh, but also with kind of the young, uh, the fresh and the talented. Yeah, 100%. And it's exciting to see a how what they all have is an innate reverence uh, for the, 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 the history that they represent, but a desire to kind of throw in a kind of sexiness and relevance to it that I think was largely missing. And I think that uh, when you look at Bespoke, one of the things that, I mean, especially when, I th when, when you think about how men want to dress these, these days, you know, they, they aren't, you know, because unless they're members of whites, they're usually going into a co-ed space, whether that's the office or a club or wherever, they want to wear something where everybody in the room notices them, man, women, anything. And I think that when you are seeing these kind of young, energetic um, and kind of attractive, upstart, young cross men and women come in and show their talent, you kind of feel like you're in really safe hands with them. And I mean, I, just to sort of uh, pick up two that I've, I've sort of recently come across from the World Championship of Shoemaking, uh, was Samuel Nornsworthy and uh, Louis or Louis Lampadorfer. Yeah. And I saw, I saw these guys, you know, they are, I mean, obviously Daniel's amazing. We love him. And, you know, you and I spoken about, he's great. Um, but he won. So, you know, everybody knows him. But, you know, yeah. there were these other guys who were young, attractive, kind of sort of, you know, uh, uh, enthusiastic guys who want to throw themselves into this craft that is entirely anonymous. You know, because they didn't win, like, people haven't necessarily heard of them. Um, and I come across them because I kind of, I'm sort of obsessively looking at shoes on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Nicholas Templeman is another one. You know, you know, young Brit. You know, it's, it's fab to see young Brits taking on shoemaking because a lot of them are coming from Japan. And that's yeah. terrific too because they're extraordinary makers. I mean, the, you know, the, the guys in Japan, they really are extraordinary um, makers. Um, but having something homegrown in a place that has such a wonderful history in shoemaking is is extremely exciting and the same can be said for tailoring too yeah well that's for sure i mean lewis you know he just returned to i think munich and opened up uh, his own shop there kind of doing bespoke work and uh, he's of course studied under daniel at gaziano and girling and um I mean, again, you know, you know, he's doing exceptional work. Nicholas Templeman, you know, Dominic Casey, who's a little bit older, but I mean, certainly does uh, not lack energy uh, or creativity. Uh, and so, you know, not only are they, you know, kind of showcasing new and interesting kind of approaches, uh, but one of the things it's also done is as they step outside the large kind of expense structure of a traditional firm, it's dropped the cost of these uh, bespoke items uh, to make them much more approachable, um, you know, to the average person. 100%. And I think that what that will always do is when you create competition like that is you force the established houses, uh, who we love, you know, Cleverly, Gaziano, and, you know, uh, uh, I, mean, I was about to say Foster, but I'm afraid, you know, it's, it's, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, they, they're a COVID casualty. Uh, yeah, so, you know, as yeah, lot, there you go. Um, you know, these guys, aren't going to miss the fact that there's this sort of competition on the horizon and, and they have to kind of up their game. Everyone has to up their game um, to, to show value, to show um, that, uh, that, that, that they're the sort of the head of the rest of the competition. You know, it's very exciting. 
Yeah. Well, and speaking of Lob, I mean, you know, Lob just recently, I mean, this has been a project of theirs throughout 2020. I mean, not only launched an Instagram account, which, you know, for John Lob, you know, on St. James's is it's something that I never thought I would see, uh, but also, you know, launched a new website. And so here they are kind yeah. of being forced uh, to really kind of, um, you know, to buy in to kind of this new era of shoemaking. Of course, it's still John Lobb. They're still, you know, the standard bearer in bespoke shoemaking. But they're having to, you know, really kind of reinvent certain ways that they communicate and interact with their clients. And I think it's a great thing, um, you know, that uh, we see this going on right now. Yeah, I agree. And what, now that we're at this sort of, uh, we're at a good juncture, how, how's that smoking? It looks like you know, it's got a great, great ash on it, yeah. holding together. You know, it's, so warming up, you know, I love, um, you know, a cigar really kind of has to come to temperature. And so you need to work through at least a, a, a one CM in order to kind of have it warm up and really kind of get into itself. And it's smoking, you know, smoothly as I would expect, um, you know, really any Cuban, especially a Cohiba. Had a little bit of spice, kind of pepper on the, uh, the front of the palate, but it's kind of getting into the, the mid body here and really kind of mellowing out. It looks like it's smoking nice and evenly, yeah. good construction, which yeah. is not guaranteed with Cuba, but I think part of the fun. Um, and this is a funny one, actually. Is it's, it plugged? It's, is it not smoking well? It's smoking beautifully, but I mean, I'm clearly talking too much because it goes out. Um, so the um, it's smoking, it's, it's a delicious cigar. Uh, uh, it's, it tastes older than I expected, which and I mean that positively. I was expecting a slightly harsher cigar, but obviously because it's limited edition, it's been aged a little bit longer. And so that might be the key to that. But still sometimes when you get new limited edition cigars, and the talisman was a perfect example of this, the, the Kiba talisman that was, um, I, have, I have one here, which is a slightly yeah. larger cigar. Um, yeah. There was 2017 limited edition. There was launched here in the UK, which is a very exciting thing. I was lucky enough to be at the launch of that. Um, uh, that, when that first smoked, People were a bit, hmm, about it because it, it had a sort of immaturity. Um, it's now one of the great cigars. It's smoking absolutely beautifully. I mean, even even Nick, who was a, who, who I remember he was a bit um, uh, skeptical about it as a, a cigar. You know, he, he and I uh, went away on a, um, as, uh, as Prince Andrew would call it, a straightforward shooting weekend. <laughs> and we had one um, over a game of backgammon and... Um, one of the it was one of my great 2020 um, uh, experiences. So, um, uh, so thank you, Nick, for sharing that with me. Yeah, um, you know, Nick is uh, he did. He's right gun, up there with the Sahakians. Yeah. Well, Nick's a funny one. So Nick, Nick I um, uh, I used to work for Nick, um, and I I joked in my wedding speech where because he was in my wedding, I, I joked in the wedding speech that I sort of still do work for him in some ways. Um, but he uh, and. I'm trying to figure out, I, in my head, I'm trying to think, does Nick want people to know that he did this for me? Uh, but Nick's always been an extraordinary champion of, 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 of me or a supporter of me and, a, and, and has given me time in a manner that very few people are able or willing to do today. And when I worked for him, he would give up pretty much every Sunday morning where we would have breakfast and we would talk about making magazines and we would talk about the luxury industry, we would talk about shoes, we would talk about tailoring, we would talk about cigars, we would talk about editing, we would talk about photo research, we would talk about the, the, the mechanisms of, 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 you know, of the plan B, you know, the, you know, the, the having a plan B, plan B is your best friend, you know, the, all the, these, these sort of uh, toolbox uh, items that one needs to, to to sort of do well or kind of function in, in, in publishing um, mm. and to do a, do so with a certain sort of, uh, I guess, uh, sort of taste or, uh, that is his, um, and so which, which I kind of steal liberally, um, you know, was something that he, he donated a huge amount of his time to me for that. And people don't know that about Nick. I think that people really, um, you know, they, he, he's, he's an irreverent man and uh, can often come across as if, um, uh, as it, you know, it, it, with this sort of irreverent style. And so people can't find it hard to read. But he's a, he's a man of immense generosity as well as, yeah. um, as talent and knowledge. Yeah. So well, I really, yeah. Well, I mean, I can't think of a better mentor. I mean, that's, uh, that's absolutely yeah. incredible. 
And, uh, you know, you yeah. can see that influence, I, I imagine, in the rake. And, of course, he continues to write for the rake. Um, you know, some of my favorite pieces. Yeah, well, I always give the good ones to him. No, that's, that's not true. That's not true. That's unfair. No, uh, but I do, um, uh, you know, there, there, there are just some things that can't really be written by anyone else. Yeah. That's how I'll put it. Yeah. I mean, his knowledge uh, of, uh, of, um, of watchmaking and watches and really the luxury space, I can't think of anyone else, um, you know, that does it as well as he does. Oh, completely. But also, the <laughs> so um, the other day, because Nick has a habit of having more knowledge than, than everybody else. It's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very irritating habit because if you think you know something and you want to sort of show it off to him, he'll outdo you, which is annoying, but never mind. So I thought, okay, I've got mine. So I'm going to talk to him about uh, Ray Fawn Williams because I'm a big classical music fan. And I love Ray Fawn Williams and I love uh, the, the kind of background to, to, to the creation of an, of an English sound and, and his, the part that he played in it. And Ray Fawn Williams would go on walks with Holst and, um, uh, he, and, and they would walk through the countryside to find and source folk music. And the whole point behind is that folk music was the place where you would find this English sound, this, this whole idea of an identity in music. Mm -hmm. and uh and the sort of the kind of pastoral influences on 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 british choral music and classical music and um anyway so i started talking to nick about this and he sort of just sort of went off a man who i didn't even know if, he, I, I, if he'd ever heard anything about sort of the sort of the english pastoralists and the, the history that he sort of just knew all of it and it's immensely frustrating yeah, it doesn't so surprise even me. my late in my latest attempt at outdoing nick didn't work yeah so, i know. mean i can't imagine i mean in some ways i think you know nick is intimidating and it's just expansive and massive depth of knowledge that um you know it's you know i'd love to smoke a cigar with him you know on this channel or him and the sahakians or shoot all three of us uh, but i'm always a little bit uh, afraid that i would uh, just be exposed for how little i actually know uh, about the topics uh, that it is we would discuss Remember, he's a gentleman, so he'll cover for you very well, if, even if that would actually be the case, although I can't imagine it is, because, you know, one thing you, you know, I, 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 um, I sometimes go around saying things about shoes, which is entirely stolen from Kirby Allison. Um, for example, I don't know if this has, you see these markings along here? It's called fudging. Yeah. I, I do that with people all the time. It's called fudging. And now, obviously, you know that. But not everyone else knows that. Yeah. Now I didn't know that, and I heard you talk about it, and I was like, "Well, I know about fudging, so I'm going to talk yeah. about it like I know <laughs> what I'm talking about." It's yeah. the great thing about doing what I do is that I pretend like I know what I'm doing and because I'm the editor, right? People just yeah. assume that I just knew it. Yeah, we were doing an unboxing <laughs> video the other day, and you know, it's kind of funny, you know, using these terms. I mean, the fudging, the pinking, you know, I mean, you know, all these kind of archaic, you know, terms to describe the element of a shoe that. You know, most people never think twice about their shoes. You know, they buy the cheapest shoes yeah. they can find. They don't take care of them. You know, they certainly don't polish them, much less even use shoe trees. And um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's funny how shoes, you know, shoes were my gateway drug into classic menswear and kind of, uh, of just the world of bespoke craftsmanship. Um, and I, there's just something really beautiful about a, a shoe and its longevity. Uh, the workmanship that goes into making a pair of shoes by hand um, and just the craft and the rich tradition surrounding that, you know, dating really all the way back in its, in its modern incarnation, probably back into the, you know, mid to late 19th century really hasn't changed that much since then. No, you're, and, and you're, you're so right to call it a gateway drug because weirdly it was mine too. Um, my father, a huge collection of cleverlies in his wardrobe, and the smell of polish yes. and leather was absolutely ingrained in me from a very young age. Every time he opened the wardrobe, there would just be this waft yeah. of it coming out. And he had loads of suits and shirts. He was a very well-dressed man, my father. He was a very classic man, an old cavalry officer. You know, he, he, he was always extremely well presented. And, um, but uh, his, his collection of shoes was something I just I noticed immediately. And um, for me, and I, I say this exhaustively, the thing about shoes for me is that they are the, the, the most um, uh, sort of explicit uh, example of the 
bridge between practicality and art, which for me is the definition of what luxury is. Yep. It's something we, we are able to use and it enhances our environment and ourselves and yeah. helps, in, in, especially even our figures as well. So shoes do that in a way that, um, that nothing else does because you have to damage it to use it. To use it, yeah. Unavoidable. Because you, you, if you're using it, you will be damaging it because the souls on the streets, you, you know, that, that, but that is what it's for. That is yeah. its use. Yeah. And um, and so the craftsmen need to factor all that in. And I think that that, that is, you know, because it, I, I, I've, I've a friend, he's a hat maker in Los Angeles called Nick Fouquet, he's a terrific guy. But I don't put a hat on and kind of sort of squish it every time I wear it. I don't sort of, you know, throw it, throw it, throw it around the room or anything before wearing it. No, 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 I place it on my head and it sits there sits undisturbed there until I take it off again. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, with my, you know, when I wear this jacket, I'm not sort of, you know, brushing it up against bricks or, yeah. you know, rolling on the street. You know, that's, I mean, that's the ideal thing. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but shoes, you have to do it. And, and uh, so that's why for me, they, they hold this sort of very specific fascination and, yeah. and interest um, and, well, um, and, and effect. Yeah, well, and I think one of the other things I love about shoes, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, that the greatest luxury is kind of enjoying art. And that's one of the things that's uh, it's acutely fascinating to me. I have this idea that, you know, you know, that like a true Estee, you know, the most interesting man you would ever meet, if you were to go to his home, everything he touches, he wears and surrounds himself with uh, is an item of quality, a craftsmanship and tradition. I use that over and over, but has a story behind it. And I think that the greatest pursuit of a man is the simplification of his life. I mean, you know, let's be honest, you know, men hate superfluous decisions. And, um, you know, at some point you just want to kind of arrive at a state of kind of homeostasis where you've like acquired all the items of quality that you really need. And then you're just, you're, you're satisfied at that point. And I think that's for me has been the philosophy behind approach or investing in quality is that a really well-made a pair of shoes can last you the rest of your life if cared for properly. And in many ways, they only get better with time, uh, you know, as they develop patina, as they develop, you know, some, some natural creasing. Uh, and the more you wear them, the more meaningful and the more dear they become to you. Uh, and, you know, the saying of an old pair of shoes, I mean, you never want to throw them away just because of how comfortable they are. Uh, I think that is such a great analogy for, uh, for items of quality, an old suit, an old pair of trousers, um, an old, you know, chef's knife, you know, that the, maybe you had made. Uh, those, uh, those are just kind of so interesting to me. My wife uh, decided when we first were, this is before we got married, that I wasn't quite madly enough. So I, uh, so she sent me on a whole range of courses, one of which was a knife sharpening course. So ever since I've become sort of uh, fascinated by knives and I, I, uh, I'm able to sharpen them on a whetstone. Um, really? And... Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. That's <laughs> so great. every few months, I get all the knives out, and I have a whetstone, and I sort of spend my time doing it. And and now I'm a bit obsessed with the gradings of whetstones that you can get, and how sharp you can make a knife become. But let me ask you a question. The uh, you were saying it was, it was quite right that um, you want to arrive at this sort of you know pre-made package of um you know a fully fledged you know ha you know interior designed house and wardrobe and all the things that you desire and love from pictures and you know uh and you know magazines or whatever so for those people who who might watch this who might think well what's the first key thing that i should get what would it be for you Ooh, that's a good question the first key thing to get I don't know. I don't know if there is a, a proper first. Um, I mean, I would I would say, you know, to anyone, start investing in good footwear just because, you know, that's something we use so much. And, um, you know, there's two things that I kind of really have thought about a lot, which is, you know, where is it that you're spending the majority of your time? Well, you're spending the majority of your time in your shoes, and then you're spending, you know, the majority of your time sleeping or in bed. You know, so the sleep experience has always been something that I've been particularly kind of uh, focused on and passionate about, you know, we have, uh, you know, bed linen made that is 100% flax linen. 
and we send it to the launder and they, you know, they press it and everything. And to me, there's no greater luxury than getting in bed after a long day and sliding into a freshly pressed set of linen bed sheets. Um, and then I recently invested in a Heston's bed. Uh, again, handmade in Sweden, 100% natural materials. I mean, it costs as much as a car. Uh, but again, you know, that's where I'm spending, you know, hopefully a good eight hours a day. And so why would I go cheap on that? Yeah, you know, I just, I never kind of understood that phenomenon. And so I think that there's two approaches to value creation. Uh, and one of them is, you know, figure out what it is you want to buy and then how to spend as little money as possible, that somehow that's creating value. Uh, but the other is to determine your budget and how much money you have to spend and then go out and seek the item of the absolute highest quality for what it is you can afford. And, uh, you know, with that second approach, I mean, that to me is the pursuit of true luxury. You know, whether that be a pair of Allen Edmonds or a pair of George Cleverleys uh, or a pair of bespoke shoes, um, you know, that's going to be something that you stretch to purchase uh, and that is always cherished. I couldn't agree more. And if I might name drop another person, uh, the great um, uh, Alex Svetkovic, who, do you know Alex? Yeah, I've never met Alex. Met. Um, Alex is terrific. Alex used to work at the Rake, and he was, so uh, he, when he was a student, used to save up. And uh, his, the, the entire savings was about getting enough money to then buy something beautiful, clothing-wise. He was absolutely obsessed with tailoring, still is, you know, he's, he is so knowledgeable about cloth, cuts, tailors, everything. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but he did something really, really impressive. You know, he would save money that would go to sell because he wanted to invest good amount of money in clothes. And when he bought something, it would be considered and it would be high quality and, uh, and, and would last for, for a very long time. And for me, there's a real, that, 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 there's a real sort of ethical side to that as well, because ultimately, you know, we're, we're all talking about you know, finding things that are sort of environmentally friendly, things that are sustainable, mm -hmm. things that are, you know, made in an ethical way. And what could be more ethical, sustainable, environmentally friendly than a suit made by somebody or a jacket made by somebody who, or a pair of shoes made by somebody who is paid a proper wage. The materials are, the, the, uh, you know, long lasting and the craft will, you know, keeps the ice and the clothing going. Um, you know, uh, it was, it's, it's, it's the best that money can buy, frankly, in, in the world. Um, and, you know, it's sourced from animals who aren't subject to sort of gross uh, animal cruelty, who are looked after because, you know, the more they're looked after, the greater the value of the, the, the cloth that, the, that is made. And, you know, tailors and, uh, and certainly manufacturers that take great pride in producing beautiful lengths of wool um, or leather or whatever, you know, the... the, the um, uh, the quality, uh, the, the, the quality sort of check process is extraordinary, and uh, so I think that there's there's a great story to be told there in, in how you know this side of um, clothing and, and men seem to the men's clothing just seems to have gotten that right in terms yeah. of you know 2021 standards of yeah. you know we're we're quite a woke community let's yeah. put it that way not intentionally but if you uh... You know, if you think about it, I mean, you make a great point in that, you know, I mean, it is the height of sustainability and of, uh, you know, kind of conscious consumerism, you know. I mean, mm. again, that something was made by someone you can go meet uh, that's put their life work into it. And, you know, I often yeah. speak that I think that in menswear, there's a little bit of a misplaced focus on the product and not, a mu not enough of an emphasis on uh, the experience and the people that make it. Uh, because to me, the relationship you have with the shoemaker or a tailor is, is as valuable to me as the product it is that they're making. And, and I would actually uh, wager to say that in the long term, it's the relationship that gives more meaning to what it is that you're wearing uh, or have purchased uh, than the product itself. I mean, you know, we've all accepted, you know, slightly imperfected items, you know, uh, whether it be shoes or a suit, uh, that, you know, at the end of the day, those imperfections are eclipsed by the fact that you know, they were made for you by someone uh, through an experience that you participated. A hundred percent. And, uh, you know, the the, um, the argument 
that it's all remarkably frivolous stuff. You know, I, you know, I, I, I guess I can sympathise with when people see it as in, in that in that sense. But actually, when you dig a little deeper into that, it doesn't hold too much water because um, when you consider the story of the the people that make it and, uh, and who are behind it and the processes that it has to go, through, it's a remarkably valuable thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's the the distinction between value and cost. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so you know we uh, you know which is why I, you know I feel like the the enthusiasm we have. For or, or, or I guess the sort of um, the anticipation that things are going to be okay on the other side of this, and that people recognise a good thing when they see it. You know that's why I think this it's, it's a pertinent conversation to have and, and a um, and a and a correct one too. I think that we are heading in a good direction, and we can feel. Um, uh, enthusiastic about the prospects of, of, of tailors and shoemakers and craftsmen when they go back to work and open open up the shops again that they're going to be the people there who want what they've got yeah um and you know now that you and i are going to be let out and so forth you know we can keep telling that story and we're immensely privileged to be doing so you know we are we are one of very few you know, or two yeah. of very few people who are able to do it um, and uh, and who are lucky enough to do it, and yeah. and um, well, it's a great privilege. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, what could be, frankly, more of a privilege than sit here and uh, smoke a cigar and talk about firstly talk about the things that we we love and we dedicate ourselves to, and um, have a great passion for, and uh, and and do it without lamenting its entire downfall. I mean, yeah. We, the, that's it's a great thing and yeah. so you know with well, that in mind i think you know, I, I think that uh sorry you were going to say well i you know I, I think one of the things i really kind of appreciate is that there is a um, you know there's a certain uh, there's a certain kind of persistence to craft uh, that uh, has allowed it to survive kind of over the decades and centuries and i hope that you know covid i don't think is going to be the nail in the coffin uh, that kills craft uh, and then i hope and i really am quite encouraged and you know, you, what you shared about kind of just subscription and the rake kind of, um, you know, reemphasizes this is that once people are able to travel, you know, that they really make a conscious decision to invest in people uh, versus investing and in just, you know, you know, uh, you know, clothing that is made in some anonymous factory on the other side of the world. And, yeah. um, you know, because a lot of these artisans, I mean, once, you know, we're able to travel again and we're able to see them and they're able to travel and do their trunk shows, I mean, they need our support especially after, you know, the, um, you know, the famine that was the last year for them. And so I hope that, you know, this year has uh, given pause for people to reflect uh, on the craft, uh, on the meaning behind it, and how important it is for these artisans to be supported and for their craft to be, um, you know, really supported. I couldn't agree more. So let's do it together, Kirby. Do our best. And, you know, telling the stories is you know, the favorite, my favorite part of the job. I mean, it's that passion that got me into what I'm doing now. Uh, and it's been so rewarding for this YouTube channel, you know, the Kirby Allison YouTube channel, to really kind of give me the opportunity to really uh, pursue that passion and embellish it in a way uh, that isn't, um, isn't just for my own consumption. Uh, and, you know, of course, the rake does an exceptional job at that, at kind of spreading that gospel. You know, we do our small part kind of through our YouTube channel. Uh, but you know we've got 175,000 people that have, subscri- that have, subscri- have subscribed, you know, and you know that that to me gives hope. And so it should. I mean, that is an amazing thing, and um, the more the merrier. So to all of you, welcome or thank you for coming back. And um, Kirby, thank you so much for uh, for your time. Uh, it's um, what is it? it's half nine where I am, but it's in the afternoon for you. Mid-afternoon. So the day is still. I'm sure there's 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 plenty still to happen for you today, but ahead of Easter, um, may I wish you an absolutely wonderful Easter um, Easter break and uh, and look, you know, as you say, April 12th, things are going to open up here. The vaccine's doing extremely well. I hear it's now picking up in America too, and um, yeah. you're saying that that um, uh, the Texas is doing doing great jobs uh, with that as well. And um, thank God for federalization, hey. Yeah, well, um, we just opened vaccines to all adults in Texas. And so, um, you know, Texas is, 
you know, finally following the footsteps of Britain, which has done a fantastic job at deploying the vaccine. And so hopefully, and not too uh, distant future, uh, we're able to enjoy a nice drink and a cigar and, and each other's personal company. It's but until happen. then, <laughs> we until have then. this. So, uh, have Tom, thank you so much. And um, anyway, Godspeed. See you soon. Godspeed. Thanks so much, Cody. Cheers. <laughs>